Hello everyone from Brescia in Italy. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there at the EFRI retreat. I hope you're all enjoying it. I'm currently attending a mosquito-borne modelling workshop here in Italy. I'd also like to just apologise for any background noise. I'm currently sitting outdoors in a courtyard, so we may be interrupted by the odd person or the odd bird. We'll wait and see. I was very excited to receive the news that I've been awarded the Scott Piper Award. So I hope you enjoy this presentation, which details some of my research and in particular that paper. I'll just flick screens at the moment. Just bear with me. All right, so before I actually get into the details of the paper, I would like to start by acknowledging the people that have all been a part of my PhD so far. It's been a really enjoyable journey and I don't know if I'm one of the few people that says I've actually really liked my PhD and all the processes along the way. But this paper in particular, my supervisors, Ali and Hamish were listed on this, as well as Cassie and Simon Reed, who's down the bottom there. Throughout my PhD, I've been really fortunate to work with other PhD candidates at other institutes and have such a supportive group here at EFRI and also in another lab group. I'd also just like to thank uh, the EFRI staff for their ongoing support throughout the PhD and other people that I've interacted with as well, including other PhD students. All right, so my PhD looks at the ecology of Ross River virus. If you haven't heard of Ross River virus, there are two really important things I want you to know about this disease. Firstly, it's a really big problem in Australia. It's our most common arbovirus, and it often makes our news headlines, especially when it outbreaks. It's nationally notifiable, so that means whenever a case occurs in any humans, it has to be reported at a national level. Ross River virus actually has a national distribution, so although it's named after a river in northern Queensland, it's found in every state and territory. It's associated with really debilitating symptoms in both humans and horses, and there's currently no vaccine or treatment available, and it's also associated with high public health costs because often when people have it, they're unable to work um, or even attend to family duties. So the second thing I want you to know about Ross River virus is it has a really complex epidemiology. There's more than 30 species of mosquito. Yes, that's right. There, there's not just one type of mosquito that feeds on you. There's more than 30 species that are capable of transmitting Ross River virus. And broadly, humans are not considered to be amplifiers which means that it has to be maintained in non-human species. The long-held dogma for Ross River virus is that marsupials are better reservoirs than placental mammals, which in turn are better reservoirs than birds. However, it gets a bit tricky because in more recent years, uh, Ross River virus has been reported in the Pacific Islands. So in French Polynesia, far on the side there, um, they looked at blood donors and at least 30% of blood donors were seropositive for Ross River virus, yet it's never been tested for. So it could actually have a wider spread. But the key thing about this is there are no marsupials in Tahiti or any of the other sort of Pacific Island areas in a capacity that could maintain transmission. So that's where my PhD is coming in. And it's really just trying to look at the dynamics of Ross River virus transmission and in particular I'm trying to connect the dots on the roles that non-human species play. So this paper uh, that I've been awarded the Scott Piper Award for, it was published last year and it makes the first chapter of my PhD. So it's actually a review on the evidence of non-human reservoirs. And to do this review I did it systematically so I followed CP's very helpful videos and tutorials on how to systematically search for some of these papers. And these are the terms that I used, the databases that I searched in. And overall, I found about 2,345 papers that fit these. Once I removed duplicates, there were 981 papers. 
and then I applied an inclusion and exclusion criteria. And essentially I was just looking for papers that contained original data, so not reviews or any further publications. This led to 36 papers. And once I went through all of the references within each of those, I found an additional nine papers, totaling 45 papers. So when we have a look at what that actually looks like in a pie chart, you can see that it's a very small fraction of papers that actually used original data to look at the non-human reservoirs. Within those, um, some papers used multiple methods, but in general, there were three methods that were used to identify a species as a potential reservoir. The first is experimental infection, and with that you have animals in a lab environment which you experimentally infect and see how they react and respond to Ross River virus. That's great, but it's not always applicable in field circumstances. Um, as those animals may not always be coming into contact with mosquitoes. For virus isolations, this is one of the best evidence that we have um, that an animal has a virus because it's a live virus found in a free living individual. One of the challenges though is that the virus only lasts about 10 days. So you're really looking for a needle in a haystack to find an individual wild animal that has a virus. And the last form of evidence is serology which is where you detect antibodies in a sample. Antibodies last a long time, so they're very detectable. But what it means is that an animal has been bitten by an infected mosquito, and we can't be sure if that animal is actually infecting mosquitoes. So each of these methods have their pros and cons. Um, and I'll step you through some of the key results within those. Firstly, for the experimental infection studies, whilst they're really useful in understanding these dynamics, Although there were only seven, they each used a completely different method, which means that the results are not comparable and we cannot do a meta-analysis. For example, they all either infected animals with different doses of Ross River virus, perhaps different strains of Ross River virus. Sometimes they co-infected them with a second virus that's in a completely different family, or they might have infected them using a mosquito as opposed to directly intravenous or subcutaneous. And then when we look at some results within that, there was one experimental infection study that used quite a diversity of species. And for that, they tested the level of virus in the individual animal's blood. And what they found is that horses had the highest viremia and little corellas had the lowest viremia. In this particular study, they used susceptible mosquitoes to feed on those animals and saw how many mosquitoes became infected. And they found that little corellas were capable of infecting 14% of susceptible mosquitoes, but horses were only capable of infecting 11%. So we traditionally use these viremia levels to determine which species are the best at amplifying a virus, but it may not always be so clear as that, as we can see here. For the virus isolation, most of the isolates have come from horses, 15. Three have come from birds and two have come from agile wallabies. I think that the number is really high in horses because as I mentioned earlier, they actually get symptoms of Ross River virus and they're a domestic species. So if your horse is sick, you're more likely to take it to a vet and they're more likely to test for something like Ross River virus. We also saw this in our seroprevalence study or review of the results and it came out that horses were 54% seropositive across all studies. And this was closely followed by um, kangaroos, western grey kangaroos in WA, which were 44% seropositive. So the key finding from this review is that the long-held dogma can be challenged. And I don't think that the evidence for marsupials as better reservoirs than placental mammals, which are better than birds, truly exists, because there was evidence across all species groups Within the species groups, I think that brush tail possums and ring tail possums look like key candidates. For placental mammals, horses and flying foxes were my species that I was most interested in investigating. And for birds, it was passerine species, and that was largely based on those virus isolations. So my key message for other PhD candidates is it's really important to revisit that conventional wisdom and just have a look at whether or not it still fits together. For Ross River virus, because there is circulation in the Pacific, 
but the absence of marsupials, it was really important for me to go back and look at why we thought marsupials were most important. As I may have mentioned, this paper was published last year in Parasites and Vectors. And there have been some pretty cool outcomes from this research so far. So since it was published last year, it's been cited seven times. And it was also developed into a conversation article which had quite a high traffic flow through it. And I wrote that article with two researchers from different institutes and that weren't co-authors on the paper. And it was just a great opportunity to increase my collaborations as well. Within the journal, the Outmetric score ranks this paper in the top 5% of all outputs um, that have ever been ranked. And for the journal itself, this is the 37th out of almost 4,000 papers um, in terms of rankings for interest within the paper. So that's where this paper was at. And I'm now just in the process of finishing off my PhD, which is due just in a couple of months. But as I mentioned at the beginning, it's something that I've been really excited to be involved in and a process that I've actually enjoyed. So I'm going to leave you all there. I hope you enjoy the rest of the retreat. I'm going to hand over to Ali, who is the second author on this paper and my supervisor to address any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.